Hello and welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great GM. In today's episode, we're looking at sexuality and whether or not you should include it in your games. Hello, my name is Guy and you're watching How to Be a Great GM. Well, today we talk about sexuality and should it be in your game or not. Now, it's a particularly difficult conversation to have a lot of people immediately to go no it doesn't belong in my game I've got nothing to do with it my game is not about sex my game is about role playing with dragons and princesses and that's it on the other hand a lot of other people say oh it absolutely has to be in there well don't worry this is not a grandstanding show of that nature today today we're going to look at what are the values to including or what is the value in including sexuality within your game, sexual, ori or sexual orientation, sexual acts, those kinds of things. How do you do that? How to include sexuality in your games? And then we're going to look at some personal examples that I've had over my many years of role playing to see if that helps make or break a case for it. And uh, I think the bottom line that one has to bear in mind to begin with is you need to do what makes sense for you, what you are comfortable in doing. So don't push yourself into spaces that you're not comfortable with. Rather just let them happen organically and naturally. But sometimes you do need to open yourself up to different experiences. And I'm talking specifically in role playing. So when we look at the value, what is the value of including sexuality within your games? Now, whether you have a particular sexual orientation or not, why should you accommodate for someone who might have a difference? Well, first and foremost, what it does is it provides support for those people around your table who may be different from you. I know this sounds a little bit strange, but it is a space where we as people come together to sit around a table to enjoy playing in another world, a different world, a world that allows us to be what we want to be. Whether that happens to be a dwarf or an elf, whether that happens to be a straight character or a gay character or an androgynous character or a character with no particular gender identification whatsoever, well, theoretically, that's why we're there. We're there to play in worlds that we are comfortable in being in and that we want to be there. We want to explore these worlds and it is a form of escapism. So by including different sexual orientations, different sexual spaces, you're allowing the players to sit at your table and to experience things that they might want to experience. You don't necessarily know. And I'm going to make a point on that a little bit later on. What it also does is it brings a difference to your game. If all of the characters in your game, if all of your NPCs are always specific to their gender, specific to their role, and they don't ever challenge that, your characters, although they may be fantastically voiced, they may be very interesting with backstories and those kinds of things, I think are potentially missing something. Imagine when they come across the big burly bartender who's got a massive beard and a big moustache and the player who's playing a large, busted, high charisma based uh, bard walks in and bats her eyelids at the barkeep. And then the barbarian walks in unshaven, rough around the edges, big battle axe on his back. And the barkeep looks at the young maiden and then looks over at the barbarian and says, well, hello, what can I get you to drink? It's a little bit different, isn't it? It's a bit, well, that's kind of interesting. The bartender instantaneously has transformed from being a run-of-the-mill bartender to a bartender who's interested in barbarians. I'm not saying that every single NPC now has to be a gender-bending, strange type of individual who's going to be hooking up with exactly the opposite of what we think they're going to be doing. I'm not advocating that in the slightest. What I'm saying is every now and again to just do that makes for a more interesting game. It adds difference to your world and it causes people to do a, oh, that's interesting, that's cool, that's different, that's something that I wouldn't have done. It allows them to experience a real space because so often in life we see somebody and we learn that they're perhaps a single mother or they're a this or a that or a next thing. And we go, oh, I didn't know that. That's, that's something that's different. It's not bad, 
It's just something that's different and now I can identify with that person a little bit more because I know a little bit more about them. So it adds a wonderful difference to your characters and as I've just mentioned it makes for a much more rounded world where you have people who've got different tastes, different likes and different approaches to life and to what happens theoretically in the bedroom. But how do you do it if you yourself are someone who has never really had any issues with sexuality, doesn't necessarily see any issues around sexuality or feels that, well, maybe it doesn't belong in your game, but you want to try and be inclusive for friends who might have a different sexual orientation to you? How do you include it? How do you portray it without it getting weird? And you're going to notice that the roles here is very weird. Now, by weird, of course, I'm not I'm not implying that this is a bad thing. I'm just saying that it's something that's outside of your regular space or it's something that you don't describe. Now, also, on top of that, a lot of games don't have any kind of sexual reference or sexuality in them at all. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. If your group of players want to play in a space where that doesn't come up, there's no reason for it to have to come up. This is merely an option for, for, for rounding out one's world, for making it feel a little bit more real, a little bit more alive, and for being a bit more inclusive. So how do you portray it? Well, as I did with the barkeep, it's a single line of dialogue. It doesn't need to go any further than that. If the barbarian's player was to, say, continue that and start to flirt with the barman, as the game master, I would respond and say, well, the barman certainly seems very impressed with your muscles and your display, and he completely ignores you, Athena. I'm afraid he hands you his, your drink, takes your coins, and then continues to stare dreamily into the eyes of the barbarian. All right, barbarian, what are you going to do? You get the signal that maybe the barkeep might be interested in you. Okay, great, fantastic, good. They go off, they have an adventure, they slay dragons, they come back, the barkeep is still there, is relieved to see the barbarian when he arrives. So you don't need to describe anything in any kind of um, sexual way. It can just be describing what the characters are going through. And when it starts to get a little bit saucy, when it starts to get to the point where, well, the barman leans in for a kiss, you might not be comfortable in describing how that, need, that anything beyond that point. And you don't have to. Think of it as TV shows or films from, say, pre-2000s, where when any form of on-screen romance was about to happen, the camera would tastefully pan out the window. There's nothing wrong with you doing that in your games, but at the same time, you've created that avenue, you've created that space for other players, or for players anyway, to feel as if, well, this world doesn't matter, doesn't care about my sexual orientation necessarily. So the words that you choose rather describe mannerisms and body language and you can step out of it into third person. I don't think I've ever played NPCs when describing their actions in first person. Their dialogue certainly I do. The dialogue I will run as a first person but I will always describe the actions of the NPC in third person so that you can do that as well if that is a little bit more comfortable for you if that's a bit of a safer space for you still gives you that inclusion, but it doesn't suddenly become very strange where you're leaning in to one of your best friends and you say, I think you're the sexiest man I've ever seen. If that's something that you're not comfortable saying to one of your best friends, I uh, certainly, um, well, I'd happily say it to them, but they'd know that I'd be completely putting their legs because all my friends look like dogs. Right, so when it comes to roles... This is where it becomes important, because now you go, okay, great, so does that mean that every second prince needs to be gay, every third princess needs to be a lesbian, and we need to have some androgynous stuff going on? How do we do it? Well, if you look at how Dungeons & Dragons itself has been progressing, if you look at how the wording has changed, there are certain races now which have an androgynous feel to them. They have this sort of gender-fluid space starting to go on. It's just how the world is moving forward, I think rightly so, but it is how the space is changing. So it's up to you to decide how those roles are going to play out. Again, you don't need to force it if you're not comfortable with it. Be aware of it. If you know of a player who's at your table who has a different sexual orientation, Throw one NPC in there, stretch yourself a little bit, use a few of the words, a few of the kind of phrases that you can describe that they have an interest, that they wink, that they do something innocuous, which has an overtone to it, 
and suddenly you've included that player and they will they will really appreciate it all the more because it will feel like that safe space which ultimately is where we all wanted to be playing in in the first place now, those roles, I also certainly wouldn't just say need to be only for NPCs that have good motivations. I certainly have used all manner of sexual orientated individuals in both good and evil roles. That's just how life works. It doesn't matter what your orientation is. If you are an evil count, you are an evil count. If you are a good wood maker or carpenter, you're going to be a good carpenter. It's just another flavor. It's another layering to the whole thing. So mix and match and play it up. Then finally, from a personal perspective, I have run, uh, I don't know how many games over the many, many, many years of uh, my role playing. And in it, I have encountered people from all walks of life, from all different sexualities. I've had people who changed their gender halfway through one of my games in real life, as well as at the table. I've had these experiences. But let me tell you, one of the most defining experiences for me was once I had personally decided to come out of the closet, I was emphatic that the group that I was going to join, it was a new group, knew about my orientation before I started. And it felt very strange to me that I had to do that. But once they'd said, okay, well, we don't really care. Can you roll a d20 or not? I went, well, that's great. Now I can relax in this space because oftentimes role-playing Dungeons and Dragons, whatever the system might be, Oftentimes that is a safe space. That's a space where people want to be, where they can let their hair down and they can be the elf they really want to be, for lack of a better word. So sometimes you might have players sitting at your table who have differences of opinion, differences of sexuality, and you don't know about it. By allowing your table to be free, you give those people a space to play in. And you don't have to say at the beginning of the game, all right, so, um, okay, LGBTI QA pluses, are, are, are you here? Okay, yeah, we got three of you. Okay, good, fine. Now I have to include that into my campaign. It's not that at all. It's about adding in one or two characters who change up your normal NPC roster and seeing where that goes. If people react positively to it, that's great. You've probably made someone at your table feel that much more comfortable. If the entire table goes, oh my god, we cut off that person's head, then you know that's not a great angle for you to take and you should probably stick to your usual routine, which will work for that table. Now, the cats and dogs. Why do I mention cats and dogs? I had a player, a very good role player, who for years played at our table and we all assumed was a straight white male who played a cat, thief, murderer, thing, whatever the case might be. Never crossed our minds that anything was different, but there definitely was. And when I discovered that, he was playing at the time a Cathar in my world. They're cat folk. I actually had another race, which was uh, basically the, the great the dog race. I had the cat fall in love with the dog or the dog fall in love with the cat. For me, it was an analogy of, you know, the differences of, well, sexuality and the differences that are there. It allowed the player to explore that space and to become a lot more comfortable with it and to start expressing it at our table, making the experience that much better. Now, when it comes to friendship, I've also made new friends who have, they don't have a gender, they don't identify as any specific gender, so they use the nomenclature they rather than he or she. It's certainly taken me a little bit to get used to using that particular pronoun because sometimes it doesn't seem to fit, I, so I just use the character's first name. Now, when I've spoken to that character, I said, okay, talk to me about that, that, that wanting to be referenced like this rather than that. It opened up a whole new world to me about this friend of mine, and it brought us closer together. Then I now speak regularly about these kinds of issues and the different type of world that they live in rather than the type of world that I live in, which is, again, different from everybody else. But by including them in the campaign and by including other non-gender specific characters, they get to play a game where... They're accepted and included, and they, that means they get a better game. It hasn't hurt me in the slightest. As a matter of fact, it's made me more enlightened, more open, and, well, great. So the game now has androgynous individuals running around it. They're still going to steal the party's treasure if they can, or help the party with healing potions. It's just about making a world 
feel a little bit nicer for those around the table. And I, safe space, I've said it so many times already in this video, it really is about just saying, hey, come in, sit down, and when you roll those dice, just know that you are absolutely welcome at this table. You, as a role player, are accepted here, and whatever you feel comfortable doing, provided that it doesn't impact on anybody else, there's no grandstanding or de demanding of certain acceptances or requiring everyone to suddenly role play a different sexual orientation, there's none of that. You sit down, you play your character. Your character is attracted to members of the opposite sex, great. If I'm going to have an NPC fall in love with you, that's the route I'm going to take. Your character prefers not to do that, but prefers same sex, not a problem. I'll do that as well. I'm going to use those NPCs how I would normally use those NPCs to get the PCs to fall in love with them, get the PCs to build and invest in them, and then I can abduct and take away and murder and kill those NPCs to get the PCs to react and to go on the adventures that I want them to go on to. So all it's doing for me is it is creating, as a game master anyway, it's creating an arsenal of weapons that I can use against the PCs to drive and motivate that story. But it happens to be the most wonderful arsenal of weapons that can possibly be there in existence in the game. And that is the arsenal of weapons of saying that everybody here is welcome to suffer equally at my table, as long as there are suffering as a player character and not as a player. You get the point. I will abuse everyone equally. That's my role as a game master. But I'll make sure that everyone is there happy and content and having as much of a fun time as they possibly can. It is something to think about. I ran a poll on Twitter. Should one include sexuality in one's game? Should one not? And the poll came back, generally speaking, that it was about 60 to 70% said, yes, you should include it, and yes, it's important. 10% said, no, not important, don't include it. And some said it's completely irrelevant. It doesn't matter. The game is not about any of that kind of stuff. It's purely about uh, role-playing in a fantasy environment. So that shows you there is an interesting space around here on our Discord server. And if you haven't joined our Discord server yet, by the way, you are one of the few left on the planet. It's grown tremendously in the last month since we launched it. Um, several, well, almost, um, well, it's over a thousand users for the last time I checked, which was quite some time ago. And that's, we have been speaking about it for the last eight hours, as a matter of fact. Different people from all over the globe have come together to talk about sexuality and those kinds of things. And there's revelations coming out. And as a group, I think we all feel just that much closer to one another, whether we agree or disagree. That's the important thing. Anyway, it's entirely up to you to think about it. It's entirely up to you to decide what and how you want to run your games. But as long as you and your players are having fun, that to me is the bottom line. Anyway, the link to the Discord server is down below, so you can join us. You can obviously find us on Twitter. You'll be, uh, you've will be you been seeing the uh, handles and things flying in and out. You can find our uh, website, of course, as well, www.greatgamemaster.com. Have a look at that. There's lots of stuff happening there as well. And until the next time, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming.